Um, thank you, Philida. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, this is such a magical place. Uh, I came here a few months ago when um, it was a different place, a bit more muddy, but now it's gone through this amazing transformation. And I know you, you all here today enjoyed uh, being seeing the site and what's, what's, what the place has been transformed into, and it's a really wonderful place. And I have to say, a real contrast to the Tate. So I want to start off by asking Philida about two big, <coughs> big projects that she's been working on, which is, to put it in the context, is two of many that she's been working on for the last couple of years, because Philida has have, have a long list of exhibitions that she's been involved in the last couple of years across the world, so it's great that she's coming here to Somerset. Um, there's a real contrast between the work we see here and the exhibition at the Tate. And we're going to talk a little bit about that, first of all. And then we're going to talk about, because I know many of you here are in the teaching profession, that is going to be actually the main focus of our conversation. So which is, this is, that's why we want to encourage you to ask questions. And the more difficult, the better, because we are living in a time when there is a certain crisis in education, and we certainly find that into, when we speak to many people in this sector. And I think it's important to talk about these things very openly, and this is a good occasion to do so. So first of all, I'm going to ask Philida about the, the work here and how that, Philida, how did that compare to the Dura project at Tate, which is a completely different in terms of scale and context and also uh, the geography? Hmm. Um, I was obviously incredibly excited and somewhat astonished to get the commission at the Tate. And um, uh, so I plunged into it with my usual naivety. So the Tate became a massive operation involving structural engineers and involving teams of people that I've never worked with before. And that then became a huge learning curve and a quite extraordinary experience. But I think the Tate, um, one of the conditions of the Tate Commission is that you relate it to the, your experience of the Tate Collection. Well, I've known the Tate Collection since the 50s when I went there with my parents, etc., etc. So I've seen it sort of go through all sorts of things and they're all quite a parade of memories that are not really particularly accurate. You know, I've seen the, 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 the Davines completely covered in white muslin for the Henry Moore show, I think in the late 50s, 59, 60, something like that. And then various other shows curated by, I think, um, John Russell and, you know, very extraordinary moments. Um, so I've seen the Davines sort of come and go as a space, and then to be able to actually occupy it um, was a staggering experience. But what happened was the, the space started to occupy me, if that makes any sense to anyone. It, instead of becoming intimidated by it or even afraid of it, I became brazen about it because it became part of my whole psychology mentally mm. and physically and I no longer saw it as a sort of official museum space where I had to be subservient to it or even which may be very insulting or even to the audience mm. it was actually within the time scale once we got the go ahead which was October the 21st 2013 and we had to have the work finished by March 2014, there was no time, it was just like all systems go. Mm. And it meant really making the work in ways that I'd made work sort of maybe 10 years earlier, which was when I was 10, 15, 20 years early, earlier when I was not keeping work at all. I'd make them for exhibitions. And the whole thing, the whole idea of an exhibition or making work for an exhibition was very much like an event. And so this became a whole series of quite 
unfinished bundles of things in the studio. Yes. <laughs> and then it was moved into the Tate. But how, and how planned were some of these? Uh, ev everything was meticulously planned. Because when you see the work in the space, you may think uh, somebody has, Phyllis has gone in and built this out of, but having gone into space, but actually it was very well thought out. You, you probably did lots of preparatory work working on that and yes a lot of very small quick drawings yeah. and because things were changing at the rate of knots during the six months previously to beginning the work because of the demands of the structural engineers when it came to actually starting the work everything in was in place to just really go for it and, and work at an, a huge speed yeah. um, it was as though it was like being let out of a cage, you know, we'd been, when I say we, it was me, I have a studio manager, and at that, that point about four or five assistants, the, there was a sort of feeling of pent up energy <laughs> to just get going with this thing and to make it in this incredibly immediate way. And because of the economic, I mean, the, the, the actual amount for the commission sounds like a lot, but once you've, paid structural engineers, transport, etc., etc. There's practically nothing left. So a lot of the materials for the actual making of the work was recycled materials that were already in the studio. And did, did, did you ever think about the audience uh, once the work had been installed, or has that still yet to be something you're considering? No, because it takes I think a while once to... once I was installing, the audience became crucial. They became another phenomena in the space, mm. and I my intention was to try and enable the works to choreograph the audience, if that makes any sense. So the act of looking up, or looking through and across, or looking around, is made there be a kind of symbiosis between the work mm. and the audience. But I think in, in the studio, it's impossible to think of the audience. You know? it's, it, it's when the installing begins, then a whole different um, relationship to the work mm. evolves, which is actually sometimes quite shocking or surprising or mm. completely different from any expectation. And that did happen in the Davine, you know, there was just this sort of unfolding well, of the it, work. It's, it's certainly been interesting watching the audiences in Tate Britain navigate the space, and they do, I use the word navigate because they do actually physically have to walk around corners, duck their head at certain points, and it's, it's taken over the space, and like many of those big scale works in this space, it totally changes the way you think about it. Hmm. So, in a way, it's very different from Martin Creed's work, which was uh, um, athletes running the length of the Devine Galleries, which is a totally different space. It makes you think about the space in a very different way. So, in terms of the space here, Philida, how did that work? Because I imagine it's, I mean, it's a completely different environment here for the Tate's uh, work. The Thames was partly an influence as well as the Tate collection, and, I and But the, here, the, this, is, this is a rule. Just one more thing about the Dream <laughs> was that, that I related it to my sort of relationship with sculpture. Mm. And that has been a love-hate relationship, you know. Um, How, what do you mean, exactly? I think when I was, began at Chelsea Art School, um, and then went to the Slade, I think you actually learned, you were taught sculpture, you were taught these disciplines of sculpture, carving, mm -hmm. welding, woodwork, and then clay, clay armature, and then casting and molding. I've, I was absolutely, I mean, I bored everybody with this story, so sorry if it's repeating it again, but I was absolutely hopeless of all of them, apart from clay, mm -hmm. and that was, in a way, what I think is still the key factor now is the idea of the mm. accumulative model surface mm. rather than the, surf, the, the objects that's relying on endless kind of contrivancy within it to make it mm. stand up or do 
what it is, so what it wants to do. Does so that allow for a certain openness and approach? Well, that's what I always want. That's my whole intention. But I think also I found it frustrating that sculpture is often only looked at at eye level. You know, you approach it at eye level, you walk around it at eye level, and yet there are all these other worlds within sculpture. There's, there's the, the below and underneath, there's the on top, there's every time, every millimetre you walk around a sculpture, it's changing and it's losing the image that you just had of it, mm. you know. And I think that's an endless fascination to me. So there's some, there was something about needing to play with sculpture as a phenomena that wasn't rooted to the spot. Mm. And it was when I went late one evening, having just visited the Devines, and I walked round to the front, because it was all closed off then with the reno renovations, mm. and I sat on the steps and looked at the Thames, and I just saw these containers floating past, and I thought, there's the show. You know, there's the sculpture being released from gravity in a way, you know, and um, floating. And it was, it was an inspirational moment to say, I want to hang these sculptures so that they're taken away from their usual role of being something you look at in a very specific way because of your height or the plinth or something, to try and give them a different kind of, in a way, choreographed relationship to the mm. audience. So I suppose that was the influence of the, mm. the Thames outside. Mm. Um, you've Sorry. also uh, about George Foulard, who's one yes. of your teachers. It'd be interesting to talk about him because his method of making his work I imagine has influenced yours in some way, but also his approach to sculpture and how he was taught. Mm. Can you tell us a little bit about George yes, Fullard? Yes, any, has anyone heard of George Fullard at all? I mean, I think there is a whole lost generation of, uh, of not just British artists, European artists, American artists even, from the 30s, 40s and 50s that weren't really hooked up to any radical movements, you know, they were certainly when you think of the French artists after the war who were dealing with the catastrophe of being invaded and their work has this sort of ragged, dark, yeah. very ponderous, no, it's, not, it's not beautiful, yeah. you know. And I think George Fullard emerged from the Second World War with, you know, having had a grenade go off in his tank and yeah. half his side of his body blown off and uh, very, very damaged, not only physically, but psychologically, but made these works which he could physically manage. So he had a very specific, and what he called way before feminism became, he said, I make art in a feminine way. And I, it was, that was what was extraordinarily radical about him. And he was, showing students Germain Richier and Louise Bourgeois mm. and Louise Nevelson, all female artists, and saying these are all artists who work with things that are hand-sized and can be therefore assembled to make an object of any size you like, and introducing ways of, and talking about ways of making sculpture that were just not part of that heroic, you know, um, tradition of sculpture, which... That, that must have been a revelation for you. It was incredible. And to all, I think, all the students who encountered him, he was... I mean, his, his love of Picasso was revelatory, you know, talking about how Picasso would connect a piece of bent, corrugated cardboard mm. into a piece of clay. But in order to do that, he had sort of put this delicate pieces of wood that would enable that to support the cardboard and just showing one, giving one a kind of lesson in building that was nothing to do with those heroic, you've got to learn to carve and you've got to learn to weld, you know, very finger wagging kind of teaching that was utterly daunting. So did, you, so did he free you to yes. think, think oh, oh okay, I can use this material, that material yes. I can do this way? Yes, especially clay. I mean, he, he would often 
quote he, got, a quote he loved from Picasso was, Picasso said, if you need to use a nail, you first of all got to invent the nail. And, you know, these kind of things which released you from a prescriptive sort of didactic way of using materials. And he always quoted Germain Richier's relationship with clay, and I've quoted this hundreds of times, which was that Germain Richier um, respect clay. It's a hysterical medium. Don't touch it too much. <laughs> and I think I know, you know, that idea that clay was a material in its own right. You didn't have to do a great deal to it for it to be something incredibly exciting and mm. interesting to use, you know. So moving on to the work here, Philida. Um, urban, rural, it's a totally different uh, dynamic to work with. I wonder if you could uh, talk about that, because it must have been a fairly, not overwhelming, but a, quite a challenge to, mm. to make that difference in scale and the setting, because the setting inevitably would have influenced, will have influenced you. Yes, I think um, we came down perhaps four or five times in various degrees of thick mud. <laughs> <laughs> and it was quite difficult to actually get a sense of the sort of syntax of the buildings, if you know what I mean, and uh, what, the, what the actual spatial dynamic was between. So in a way that was very sort of liberating after the Devine, you know, that it wasn't, the space actually wasn't there. Mm. Um, we did have measurements, and the first thing that we knew, and I say, again, I'm saying we, the studio, my studio manager and the people I work with, that the doorways are tiny. So it was a real ship in the bottle thing. And the first um, idea was to go really polite and make a series of very small, <laughs> nice sculptures. That's, that's not you, Bernard. Not that's horrid, that's... ugly things. <laughs> So, uh, and that very quickly, I just didn't have the patience. <laughs> and so these nice sculptures turned into monsters, and then that became quite exciting, um, finding a way to get them through the doors. And I'm sure Alice remembered, but as the sort of cement went on, the plaster went on the walls, and the cement went on the floor, the sort of doors shrunk even more. So. <laughs> We had to keep on cutting these works up bit by bit until we knew we could get them through the doors. And one didn't survive getting through the doors, and that's the cement one that's outside there. <laughs> and, and I'm glad about that, because it's like the sort of one that's escaped from <laughs> the building. But that was then became an issue about making the work kind of press up against the quite sort of almost folksy, barn-like structures and make, make the work either kind of be elbowing its way up against that um, and at the same time using it. Because it's very strange if the beams go across like these here, you've still got two or three meters above. So you've got this sort of strange contradiction in the space. And also the whole environment, you know, sort of contemporary art, um, exhibition in, in the middle of a field is a sort of strange mm -hmm. but very, very exciting concept. You have you ever worked in this kind of environment? Well, at, at Roche Court, um, yes, at, at Roche Court I'd done um, a show which is, I mean, is very, very different mm -hmm. from here, but there's, there's a similar kind of event where you come across things that are unusual in the environment. But in terms yeah. of the work here, the pom-poms, mm. for example, they, yes. uh, uh, do they come out of um, your drawings, for example, mm. they come very much out of being, having spent time here? Or I think there's an accumulation you talked about. I think they're like so. a kind of familiar theme that I've used. I've used them for about 20 years, so I'm used to them, mm. you know, and it, they seem to be something where I'm thinking of a very particular mood. Mm. On one hand, I'm not quite sure what tense the m mood is in, whether it's past, mm. 
yeah. or present or future? Is it, do they represent something that's happened? You know, the part is over. Mm. <laughs> or is the party just, just the about to begin? Exactly, yes. Or are we actually in the party now? Yeah. And I, I, that's, for me, they have that kind of ambig ambiguity. It's mm. like looking at the debris after, uh, you know, Germany wins seven one. Hi. <laughs> Mm. I think the materials I use are incredibly simple, practical materials. It's what will fulfill the job in hand. And also, I like materials where I know if I'm going to try something out and it's a disaster, which it, it often is. It's, I mean, it is expensive making sculpture and even using cheap materials like a bag of cement, which is 11 pounds, <laughs> you know, if you're going to use four bags of cement and it's a disaster, you know, you some, it, it, it racks up the cost of the work. But I know that they're still comparatively cheap. Sorry, it's a really boring <laughs> answer to your question, but it's, it's actually... Yes, yes. Those, half of those the timber that's gone on is the offcuts from Tate Works and half is new timber and it's that very thin, cheap ply. So the work, you know, the, the single components of the materials are, are actually cheap and you can just go and get them at Wix or B&Q <laughs> anywhere, but by the time you're using them in the quantities I'm using them, they're not cheap anymore so it's a it's a sort of paradox you know but I'm interested in materials that I know I can work and rework again so there isn't a sort of I don't have to be precious with with materials yeah thanks can we move on to um uh, teaching yes yes because it's a, a long list in fact of where you've taught and those experiences would be fascinating to hear about. You first started teaching in the in the sixties, mm. um, and you'd also been a student at Chelsea and Slade yourself. Mm. And you, I believe you started at Bristol, then yes. Chelsea, then Brighton, yeah. then Camberwell, and then the Slade. Yeah. And that's a really interesting cross section of, uh, of art schools. How did you decide to go in? teaching in the first place? Was it a necessity or a desire? Yeah, no, I think it was a boom time. The Summerson, I mean, it's sort of historical and hysterical <laughs> both. <Yeah. laughs> I think the old, um, the old art school system of assessing the, what was called the National Diploma in Design had, had, was just collapsing, you know, nobody saw the relevance of it anymore so they brought in what was called the diploma in art and design mm. and so i left chelsea after three years unqualified actually because there was no nd ndd and no dip ad but then i went straight to the slade mm. and absolutely hated it after the sort of incredible it was the beatnik year at Chelsea from 60 to 63 and Chelsea was in the thick of it and it was the most sort of incredible um, atmosphere there and everything and then going to the Slade which was like grim punishment you know. <laughs> What was, what was the did anyone here go to the Slade? <laughs> but it was I. Well, why, why was the Slade? I think it was the you know the Euston Road method was still in full because fling. There was these apps, there was the way of drawing, mm. but secreted within that was also the influence of Bomberg wow. as, as through Auerbach, and I slightly aligned myself with that lot. But also 
William Coldstream, I don't know if any of you have heard of him, was actually an extraordinarily enlightened man. And after I was sort of being a very difficult student, underlined, he came down to me and he said, you know, you have two choices. <laughs> you can stay or you can go. <laughs> Those were the days, you know. <laughs> and, and then he started bringing in, Robert Rauschenberg had a, exhibition at Whitechapel mm. in 64 was it or something mm. and he got Robert Rauschenberg to come and do um, to be at the Slade and Larry Rivers and a whole succession of extraordinary artists mm. and that just changed the whole metabolism of for, mm. for students like myself who were beginning to discover what was going on mm. across the Atlantic and in Italy and you know that there was another way of making art was beginning to mm. press its face against the British craft-based ways of making art of that time, mm. you know. It was a very extraordinary, I think, intersection of the British art establishments with art schools waking up to the fact that there were things going on not a million miles away, that were completely questioning where art ended up, who it was for, what it could be made of, its longevity or not. You know, where was an art space? All these questions that I think turned the then rather conservative British attitudes to making completely on its head. Mm. Yeah. Do you think those conservative attitudes still exist in yes, some quarters? Yes, I do. Yeah. <laughs> And why are they still there? Or, or, or how do they manifest themselves? Because I think there's a passionate love of craft. Mm. And I wouldn't, you know, go against that. But for me, just to put my cards on the table, I think making sculpture is about the abuse of craft. You mm. know, it's about it's a good word. turning mm. the craft to a completely new in a new way. I mean, as Picasso did when he was working with the broken bits of ceramics. Mm. <laughs> Destroying to rebuild. Yes, yeah, exactly. And it seems to be rather against the kind of British artistic nature to renege on things that seem to have an in inherent quality that is instantly mm. identifiable. And I, I respect that. But I don't, for me, the, the processes of making art go way, extend way beyond that into a territory that releases itself from those. Um, but then you have to look at Barbara Hepworth and you see that element of craft and form united in something that I think is absolutely fantastic. So it's not as though I'm saying it's not one or the other. Yes, no, exactly. Yeah. And so how have, you, how have you seen how art education has changed over the decades? Uh, I mean, imagine everybody here has mm. a very strong opinion about that, and please do yes, interject. I'd, I'd love to know, because uh, I've been out of it for since 2009. Mm. And in a way, I saw the last, I, I really would love some feedback on this, because in the last 10 years of the teaching, we had all these assessment exercises, you know, where you had to account for yourself. Yeah, every, people are nodding. <laughs> and uh, the, the whole, the sort of thumb screws were being put on what an art, fine art course had to be. And maybe that was necessary. <coughs> but I think what, what happened was this fact that in order for there were things like learning outcomes. There was a whole new language that came phrase. in. Yeah. That so that students, I remember when it came up at the Slade and the authorities higher up at UCL were saying, Cat, we're, we're, we're putting into practice this um, process whereby you ask the student what they're going to do, and then you book a tutorial, and you go through this checklist and see whether they have done what you've... Now, that, there was just uproar. Mm. 
<laughs> and complete anarchy. And, and so we escaped having to do that. But I think that's something where I speak to young tutors in art schools now, and they do have to do that. that the students way? have to write a statement about what they're going to make, and then the tutor comes along and says, yes or no, or why have you suddenly made it out of smoke when you said you are going to make can, it out can of... We ask, can we ask that? <laughs> yes. um, well, well, I, so I, I teach in a school, and I teach young yeah. students, and, um, and so I don't uh, have direct contact with with the art school that's at the moment, but. I think that because our young people from primary school age are, are being uh, educated in, in that framework, yes. you know, if I say to a, I might ask a kid a question, and they'll be immediately thinking, oh, okay, how many marks, therefore how many points do I need exactly. to make in response? Yeah. And then when mm. you present them with very anarchistic contemporary art, um, they don't naturally have that language or a, a ability to just free range in their mind to access it. So it makes it much more difficult for us as art teachers in schools because uh, a whole generation of children are being brought up with a very different way of thinking and analysing and sort of accessing. Can I ask you, is it, is it about teaching children to know what the result is? Is this, is, is this a kind of issue? Because this is what I found in my latter stages of the, the, the Slade, that there should be some sort of confidence that the result was going to be one of these three choices. Yes. And you didn't go off piste, so to speak. To. Yeah, I think it just yeah. makes it very much more difficult for for students to work in a very open-ended way. But is it that, oh, you see, I, I think if, say, you're, you're wanting to build something... I mean, I had groups of very young children at the Tate, and it was, I, I thought it was lovely what they asked. That, you know, they, they've, none of them asked what it meant. They all wanted to know the practical things, like how did, how, you know, how did I make the cardboard stand up? I mean, just brilliant questions. Um, was the material of the hanging grey blocks, was it real? And mm, I just thought, yeah. yes. And I said, what, what did you mean to this little five-year-old? You know, he said, it looks like paving. It looks like the pavement. And I said, no, it's not. It's crumbly white polystyrene. And then, you know, just that thinking to me is an absolute indication that a, a child will just get the right questions. You know. want to preserve, isn't it? Yes, it's yeah, yeah. So, you know, okay, it sounds like um, whatever, but I mean, you know, you can make a box, can't you? A, a cereal box, be anything in a way, you know, cover it with anything and it becomes anything. And I think they have that. I, I totally understand what you're saying, and I find it quite worrying that there is this sort of result pressure from incredibly early on. I can't believe that a four-year or three-year-olds are now expected to write their name. I don't think any of my children wrote their name till they were about eight or something. I mean, I don't, they seem reasonably okay now. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it just seems horrific. But I mean, you must tell me because I'm probably. I think it's quite interesting relating what you're saying about learning outcomes. You know, as mm. teachers, we now have to have the learning objectives and yes. success criteria. And again, I think that's another situation which narrows because the children all have to be told what those things are. We have to write them on the board in front of our lessons. So the children just look at this very fixed set of criteria. And that is what ticks the boxes. Mm. To go beyond that means they're not being successful. Well, well that's which is yeah. a real, you know, it's disastrous, isn't it? Well, well, we, we were talking about this. Yeah. Schools, oh, right, where yes. my children can't read. I mm. still have to write the objectives <laughs> on the board, <laughs> and the success criteria. It's beyond me. I can't, you know, that is I so that. shocking. Yeah. yeah. Well, I find the word success poisonous, you yes. see. I, I mean, I hate it, and I, 
I'm not being a miserableist by saying I think failure is one of the most wonderful things to experience. Why has it become such a taboo that we can't do things and work through a whole succession of things that may be wrong or not work out and then use that as a fantastic experience, you know, both in discovering who you are, yes. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's certainly at the heart of what it is to be an artist is learning how to fail and fail again, fail mm. better. Mm. Exactly, yeah. Philidy, yeah. in connection to, to that, you, one, you, earlier you, you asked the question, what is education and what is learning? Mm. That ties into what you've just been talking about. Is, how, do you, how can you try and explain the difference to somebody who's trying to impose well, something. Well, I hope you'll, you know, do shout back, but education <laughs> seems to be something where there's a fixed premise and you come out of it with your, your six GCSEs and the boxes. Are Learning seems to be something that continues your entire life and there isn't a scale of judging. But to what I've always thought was remarkable about art school education was the fact that it was about learning. It was about offering clues to a way, a process that might shift someone's experience, make their, someone's experience of how they're looking at the world or how their imagination was operating, how they then translate that. Um, that they expand that because you're being able to say, ha have you thought of maybe casting this or making a mould, you know, or um, using an entirely different material, you know, and that kind of thing. Is that something perhaps we could ask the audience? If, it's, if you were talking about the, the straitjacket of certain uh, ways of being asked to teach, but are there possibilities to, to open up the way you teach in that respect, in other ways that, uh, other ways to find freedom? That was an open question. <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping for an answer. <laughs> the problem is that we're in the trenches, so education is like moving backwards. Um, our president, the director for the uh, Secretary of Education, um, the initiative was like moving back in 1945. Mm. It isn't quite so. Hmm. I th sorry, sorry. Okay. We're also a union of straight projections of technology that we're producing art that, or design that's got an end product that is a job. And so if you're teaching 14, 16, 18 year olds, you're trying to free them up. Well, they're not free up because what's the end product? Is it that we are being artistic or is it that we're aiming to get some sort of work out of it? So yes, yeah, yeah. We're, we're teaching them to, to get the job. Yes, I think it, I, I understand, I mean, I don't think I should be too idealistic because I think the, the learning route isn't about not having a result. It's more what kind of results are being demanded of us all at any particular time. And it's, it's a bit like, I mean, I don't know much about maths, but I remember when you know, you had to show how you worked something out in the margin. <laughs> and I always thought that was fascinating, you know, that you had your, whatever it was, your problem to solve, but then on the right-hand side there was a margin which showed sort of how you were thinking about it. And, and that seemed to me, even if the answer was wrong, that bit on the right would, would show you something about how you were processing the problem. And I think maybe that aspect of um, making something or bringing something into the world that isn't a conventional object, you know, it, it's fascinating to be able to say, well, all those things are in a way as important as the end result, you know, but I, I I totally understand that with an exam-based system, you've got, there's, there's a need to know what these people should be focusing on and 
how they achieve that because their futures depend on it. It just seems it's infil infiltrated from the very young children right up to the university system. And I just find that perplexing. So the, the sort of BA in fine art is in a way replicating the experiences they've already been through at GCSE and A level. And that, instead of it maybe going into a different, I mean, freedom's a funny word, isn't it? Because I'm not sure whether any system which has an institution attached to it is going to have freedom. Yeah, if I can just interrupt, my experience of working with BA students for quite a few years is that mm. they will all describe their learning happened in those serendip serendipitous conversations that happened in the corridor with the lecturer mm. rather than the, the studio. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So that's mm. Hmm. And does that have any connection to the economics of uh, what it takes to fund a hmm. course? I mean, Philida, um, is there a situation where it's cheaper to do a certain type of course which would result in a certain type of teaching? Does that, is that your I, experience? Would be also good I think know. at the moment that, I mean, I know at the time I left the Slade, there was a huge drive to increase the numbers for PhD because they were the cheapest course to run because you need, what, a supervisor and, you know, you do your research elsewhere in the library, etc., etc. And whereas BA courses are the most expensive courses to run because students need the most um, amount of teaching <laughs> to and so I think there is a real issue in my opinion about where theoretical studies you know are placed within the art school environment mm -hmm. and their influence on making um, I just heard the other day I've forgotten where it was somewhere somewhere was getting rid of sculpture you know even I mean it's always been a problem, sculpture. <laughs> yeah. um, but I think this idea of being able to get rid of it is really quite... <laughs> mm. <laughs> it, it says a lot. It says the language is redundant. Nobody wants to do it. Which there is isn't... insane. Yes, yes. Yeah. But it also suggests that making things isn't sculpture. You know, it's actually applying quite a sort of ruthless and didactic theoretical argument to um, a and whole history, actually. <laughs> and could that also include the influence of the digital uh, and certainly how young artists might work mm. and also might be taught that it's the computer is a, has become, for various mm. good or bad reasons, a resource tool rather than the library yeah. or the, conversa yeah. the group conversation yes. the analysis. Um, yeah. How do you think the digital edge has affected the, and this is another question it would be mm. great to hear your views on, yes. because I yeah. must be having an opinion about that. What, did, what effect would that have in terms of how people think about how they approach? Well, at the lowest point, I, I do think, and perhaps this sounds a bit moral, I always felt in there was an issue about when the going got tough, with sort of making and painting and making things, it would be to go and grab the video camera and get the hell out kind of thing, you know. And I, I often felt that that was the point where maybe if that particular problem or difficult time that person was having was just stuck at, you know, there would be something interesting beginning to emerge that might have been combining the two, combining the, the, the projected image with the, the physical image, you know. But it was so often something where you abandoned that, mm. those, those processes. But, yeah, I mean, I think the video art has never had the same issues as painting and sky. It's never had to look at itself and had the accusation like painting is dead, mm. you know, the Victor Bergen mm. 
issues of the 70s or even sculpture is dead. But video has always been able to sort of sanctify itself on a much, on an intellectually higher <laughs> plane for some reason. And I, I think it's interesting. So I, I think there is some fantastic art that's coming out of the projected image. I think that it's in abundance. <laughs> Can we open up to general questions? I'm sure there are many. Growing up in the North East, up in Newcastle, you were obviously subjected to an experienced industry such as shipbuilding, mining. Hmm. Has that influenced your very industrial I left when I was about four, actually. So, but we, we we used to go back there a lot, yeah. But um, so what inspired you in, while you were there? Um, in terms of your art education. What inspired? How, yeah. How, how did you run against painting? You went through sculpture. How hmm. what influenced you as you were growing up and taking in those exper experiential learning opportunities hmm. that were available to you in the northeast? Where have you moved from that? I think, I think the, the, the actual revelation that with making something with clay, it wasn't just the image. It was like being released from the imprisonment of the image. There was a huge margin of error that could be <laughs> explored with using play, clay and plaster and found materials where the actual physical engagement with it, the sort of dance around the work, was as much the work as the end result. I think the, I mean this sounds <coughs> sort of histrionic, but I think the very, I think the, the for my generation and people who are older than me. The, the Second World War <laughs> does sound so dramatic to say, but I think it did cast a long shadow, so especially with my parents. My father felt it was his duty to take us round the bomb sites of East London <laughs> and show us what had, what had happened. I mean, it, I think it affected, like all our parents, it affected them profoundly, you know, and I think they were very determined that we were very, very aware of that. And I think that has, in a way, had a, had a profound effect on me, you know. And they, um, I think, um, you know, my, my father, for instance, was one of the first people to found this movement called Medicine Against Nuclear Weapons. And we used to have to go on these we went on the first Aldermaster March, and all that kind of history was very significant, you know. But I, I'm not saying it, that in any way that's the subject of the work, but I think the whole idea of destruction and reparation, in a way, as we've seen here, you know, this was a ruin and it's been restored, that whole cycle of the way things are constantly changing is, is an incredibly important part of making sculpture for me. You know, that, that as much as something might be finished, it can also carry on. <laughs> I find it very difficult to know when things are finished. <laughs> I hope that answers your question. More questions? Yes. I think about I think the colours I use are attention seeking colours. You know, they they come from the street, um, and they're very pragmatic. They're straight out of the tin. Yes, they are. Yes, and it's the the kind of colours that I like that sort of switch between each other. And I like the way black can sort of punctuate. Because they are quite painted, so it's important. The sculpture, they're quite painted. Yes, yeah, I think, I mean, I, I love painting. And I think there is, 
in a way, when I first started working in clay, it was like using paint. It was like a you know, sweep of the hand across the clay was like the sweep of a brush. You know, it had that incredible directness about it. But the fact that it had this solid shape attached to it was so completely thrilling, you know. <laughs> I think it's somehow I'm hovering between the two, but... Oh, yes, that's a very nice way of looking at it, yeah. yeah. That's a good question. Do you work as the energy of your art student? Do you feel like part of what you're doing? It's what, sorry? It's the energy of a young art student. Mm. Do you feel that's something that's carried on since you were a young art student? Yes, I think it has. I think just the, for me, the thrill of occupying a space that I would other occupy. I mean, it sounds incredibly sort of egocentric, but that kind of relationship, which it is, of a physical thing emerging in front of, which was my sort of discovery with sculpture. You know, that the, this wasn't a thing that you put on the wall and stared at backwards and forwards. This was a thing that you actually had to have this impossible relationship with, you know. And uh, I think that's sustained itself over the years. It's not all, I mean, I've hated it sometimes. I've hated the sheer physical impossibility of making things quite often, you know. And as well as also quite liking it sometimes, you know. <laughs> Mm. I have a specific question, but I've been making me think a lot, so this is just a sort of like a statement to begin with. Mm. Um, I teach art, but I'm not sure that I can teach art, because mm. I don't know myself what art is. Mm. I expose myself to it as much as I can. I'm addicted to art, mm. but mostly it's, it's sort of like uh, osmosis, it's sort of like a tea bag thing, it mm. flows in and out, and I don't talk about it that much myself. And yet we're now in this education system where we're expecting our students to talk and write and be intellectual mm. all the time. Mm. Whereas for me, well, I was a little bit shocked, I suppose, interested in one of the teachers I talked to here who said when they're bringing their students to this gallery, they would have to get the students to record it and write down what they've seen and do mm. projects and all that sort of stuff. Where for me, I would just bring my students here and, and let it Mm. Mm. Let, let, let it happen. Mm. Um, and it always surprises me at, at the other end of, the, of whatever I'm doing. I have students who do get it. Mm. And they are producing work that blows, blows me away sometimes. I don't think I've taught them it. They somehow mm. gathered it and learned it. So I think the learning thing is so much more important than the teaching mm. thing. Learning yeah. is not so important. But you're, you're providing a very um, supportive Absolutely. context in which your students feel confident that they can just absorb or reject, that they're, they're in that sense, free to make a whole range of decisions, really which I think, and yeah. Yeah. And yeah. The, yeah. The I think it is, I think, um, I sense like at Tate or a lot of museums where the education programs tend to justify the existence of the place that there's a, there is a bit of a problem yeah. with that. And I think it's, um, I mean, why, why should people like art? They don't have to, you know. Yeah. <laughs> they, they don't even have to go and look at it if they don't want to, you know. And I think, I think it, it shouldn't become a moral crusade, you know, which I, I, I think you're indicating as well. Um, but I think we're all in very difficult positions as teachers in knowing where that, that line is between allowing something to just happen in its own time. I, when I was in um, Dallas on a, on a sort of residency thing, it was attached to the University of Texas. And um, part of the, the way I had the residency was that I had to do these classes with the students from the University of Texas. And the classes were 400 
you know, 400 students. And one of the things was that they had to go and write a review of my exhibition. And they were all science students, but they had to do a credit in an art thing. And so I went into this lecture hall with 400 students, and I'd been given the 400 pieces of paper. And one of them said, I, ma'am, I went to the gallery, and I didn't see any artwork. <laughs> So I asked um, who that was, and he put up his hand. He said, and I said, did, uh, did you not see the work? It was the work. And he said, well, if that was the work, you hadn't finished it properly. <laughs> and it, was, it, was, it then triggered into an extraordinary discussion. And none of those students wanted to do this credit. It was just the easiest one to do, because they only had to write a 500 <laughs> critique of the work. But the other one was. Um, Ma'am, this is the work of Satan. This was the, this was, <laughs> this was the Bible Belt, you know. And, Ma'am, you have no idea of beauty. So I was able to open up the discussion. I was really interested, you know, to find out why this person thought it was the work of Satan, and the other person thought it wasn't beautiful. So I asked the one who thought it was. Well, I said, Well, what is beautiful? And uh, he said, ma'am, the Texas sky is beautiful. <laughs> and, um, you know, your work is ugly. And this, but it triggered this extraordinary discussion. And I think in, in that sense, being able to talk, do, do you know what I mean, in a way that you're, you're indicating might not be so helpful. That was really, I, I found it incredibly inspiring, actually, meeting those people. Those conversations go on. Exactly, yes. And, and sort of bringing God into it. Yes. <laughs> Suddenly being completely wrong footed about. <laughs> I don't mean any offense to anyone, but I mean it was extraordinary that I was suddenly the creature from hell. <laughs> so I think that is quite wonderful actually in that way. My simple question is what happens to our passports designed specifically for these spaces? Um, I maybe I I, uh, woo, uh, <laughs> I actually uh, when I was here on Saturday, I was in the end room with the posts, and I was by myself in there, and uh, an elderly gentleman and an elderly lady came in. And I was round the other side, and I heard her turn to him and said, I mean, what on earth do we do with this stuff? <laughs> so, <laughs> and I sort of crept out <laughs> round the side of it to avoid being involved. In <laughs> but um, good question, and I haven't got an answer. So uh, <laughs> I'm hoping it might go... I'm in conversation with Sarah, who's who I work with, and Melissa, who I work with at Hauser and Worth, and we're thinking of actually, oddly enough, sending the whole exhibition to Dallas. <laughs> Which, <laughs> more, more work of Satan, yes. Yes, <laughs> yes. yes. Um, we've run out of time, but uh, thank you so much to Phyllis thank you. and thank you to everybody here for coming and uh, look forward to seeing you again here. Yes, yeah. Thank, thank you, you so very much. much. <laughs>